In this 2D side-scroller tutorial, we're going to focus on making a simple enemy that you can jump on to kill. That's a very standard thing you see in a lot of 2D side-scrollers. So we thought this would be a good place to introduce you to enemies and enemy mechanics and how to make a few mechanics that are very standard to 2D games. So we have our main character here, and uh, let's go ahead and bring in a goblin as the enemy. So let's open up the prop gallery. Let's go over to characters, and uh, let's find our goblin bruiser. And we're just going to bring him here. I'm going to turn on Snap to Grid. Makes things a bit easier. Make sure he's lined up with our main character. We want to make sure they're on the same plane. Let's then uh, rotate him around. And for now, let's actually put him right here. And let's move our main character back. So we're going to put him here. Let's grab the main character. Bring him back a bit. It's a bit easier when we're working on completely flat terrain, and, and now that we have this, let's uh, let's increase the size of the uh, pathway we have here to go all the way back to the main character. There we go. So first thing I want to do is most of our characters will have a default brain in them, so let's jump into the brain of our goblin, and let's just delete the whole thing. Now I can do that by uh, quickly hitting X to delete all these lines or open up the brain options and uh, choose to delete page. So I'm going to delete the page. Now we're going to keep that deleted because the first thing we want to do actually is something that we're going to need to reference inside of our enemy and that is who the player is. So it's really important when you're creating a game in Project Spark to look at things that are going to be referenced by a lot of objects. So we, for instance, have a player. Almost every 2D side-scrolling game has some sort of player. And it's great if we define our player through a global variable, and this global variable will allow anything to reference this player and call this player, which you're going to see in action. So let's go ahead and do that. So under the once tile, we're going to create a new line of code. And on the do side, we're going to go over to values choose global and then go to values again go to objects and let's create a new object variable called player and let's set that equal to this guy we're in the brain of so equal to me now what is a global object variable so a variable is something where you set a value to be equal to this variable and you can call it within that object when it's set as global, that means any object can call this variable called global player, and we've set it to be equal to me, which is equal to this guy. So if this goblin were to, were to ask, who is the global player, it would tell him it's this guy. And that becomes really useful in what we're about to do with our goblin. So we now have that set up. And the next thing we want to do is we want to steal some code from our, our main character onto our enemy. You're going to be stealing code from uh, lots of things often. It's always the best way to do things when you uh, can kind of steal code and not have to write everything from scratch. So what we're going to steal is locking down the x-axis of our enemy. So we have that right here. So let's go ahead and just steal this whole thing. Uh, once team equals one, all that stuff. Let's steal, steal this, copy this entire line. Go into the goblin. And let's paste that. Now let's get rid of uh, global player equals me. We don't need to worry about that. We don't need to worry about left stick dead zone because that was related to you actually using the left stick to move the player. And uh, their team, they're an enemy, so we want them to be on a different team. So their team is going to be equal to team two. And then it also has constraint x access equals their position x. We go back over to the player and steal one other thing, and that is position x equals constraint x access. And just like that, our goblin is now locked on the x-axis. Now, it's not actually doing anything yet. We just locked it to the x-axis. If we go into test, nothing is happening. This goblin has no sort of other behavior on it. So let's start putting another behavior on it. And so let's, let's think about this. We want this goblin to recognize that you have jumped on top of its head, and that kills it. So how does this goblin recognize that you've jumped on top of its head? This is where we use sensors. Sensors are things built into every object in Project Spark. 
that allow it to look at sort of things around the world and, and sense and understand what is within its sensors. So if you were to go to the properties of the Goblin Bruiser, go to Brain, you're going to see this sensors area. Click on that, and we're going to turn trigger sensor to true. Now, it also has detect sensor and vision sensor. A detect sensor is basically a sort of sphere around or a bubble around this character where if something is within that bubble, it detects it. A vision sensor um, is a cone kind of going out from the eyes of this character, so what this character can see. But a trigger sensor is the kind of sensor we want. And we can see it now that we've turned it on outside here. So that's this cube right here that's around this goblin. The nice thing about sensors is basically these sensors can look for if anything is within this sensor, we can do something. Now this is a very large sensor. This is, this is not really useful because we could say, like, you know, if this character is in the sensor, then it kills the goblin. Well, you're going to be in the sensor before you're even jumping on top of the goblin. So let's turn off snap to grid and let's hold down a left bumper. And what you'll see is you can change the X, Y, and Z scale, as well as rotate um, the X, Y, and Z vectors for every trigger. So let's go ahead and let's decrease this to just be the head of the goblin. So we're going to bring it down quite a bit on all different uh, scales. And we want to get this perfectly matched up to the goblin's head. This is something that you probably will have to play around with a bit, a bit too, because um, different characters have a different, you know, perfect placement of where their collision is. So this looks about good. We have a little trigger zone now. It's very tiny, but it's just above their head, and that's kind of what we want. We want this trigger zone just above the head of the goblin. Now let's go ahead and use that trigger zone inside of code. So what we're first going to look for, actually, is first we want to make sure that the player is above the goblin. Because if the player, for instance, if, if the player runs into the goblin, say just like that, without jumping on it, you see the player could still technically run into the trigger zone without jumping and the goblin might die. So we want to make it so that the player um, has to jump and be above the goblin for this to work. So. We're going to, within code here, we're first going to look for when global, uh, then we choose player. Now this is calling that global player that we set. So this is, this is why we want to use that global player variable. So when global player, we go to sensors, we go to relative position sensors, and we're going to choose uh, objects, let's see, it's not on this page, so we go to the second page, objects above. Perfect. So when the global player is above us, or is an object that is above us, then when we use the sensor in trigger zone, and the thing we're looking for in the trigger zone is the global player. Now this might look kind of weird. You know, this is not how you construct it in, in a sentence in the English language. What you typically ask for is, is the global player in my trigger zone? But what this does is that's actually first you know, sometimes code doesn't work exactly like the English language. This is first calling this trigger zone and then saying, all right, I'm looking at the sensor trigger zone, and I'm now looking at what is the thing I want to detect if it's in this sensor. So this is why we say in trigger zone, global player. Then underneath that, so let's uh, make another child line here. Then we simply want to say, go to combat and kill. This kills the goblin. And the other thing is, if you play you know, a 2D side-scrolling game, usually when you jump on top of an enemy, you then bounce off of it. So that allows you to kind of chain jumps. So we want to actually program that by saying, let's go to objects, let's say it, and then movement, jump. So what is it? It refers to the most recent thing that was talked about on the win side. So whatever was most recently talked about or referred to on the win side, that is it. So this is just a shorthand to allow you to not always choose or directly set global player here. So the it is global player because that is the most recent thing that was checked for on the win side. So that's what it refers to right here. So this will make global player jump as well. So let's jump in a test and see what that looks like. 
So now I jump on top of the goblin, and bam, goblin dies. I bounce up. That looks great. That's exactly the kind of um, thing that I wanted to happen. But this doesn't exactly make an interesting game, because if we just have static enemies that are doing nothing, it makes it very easy to, uh, to jump on top of them. And you also saw from that, it looks like I was able to hit the side of the goblin without me jumping on top of them. So that means our trigger sensor is still a bit too big. So we can go ahead and continue to tweak that. So we probably want to bring the uh, Z scale down even more. So maybe to something, maybe something like this. So this, this is probably something you're going to have to play around with for every character. If you're ever having trouble getting uh, a trigger zone to exactly match up to the head of a character, you might even want to attach an object to their head. That's not something we're going to cover in this tutorial, but um, attaching an object to their head and using it, that trigger zone can sometimes help. But uh, typically, you'll just, you'll just have to play around with this trigger zone to get it to a good point for this enemy. So uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to make this enemy just move backwards and forwards. So kind of move back and forth and back and forth to give some sort of movement challenge here. So we jump into the, to the character, and we are going to use a countdown timer. So we're going to say countdown timer of two and a hold time of five. And we're going to have this loop. What this does, countdown timers wait for a certain amount of time, and then a hold timer does something for a certain amount of time. So, and then this loops it. So this goblin will wait for two seconds, then do something, whatever I put underneath of here as a child line, do something for five seconds, and then loop. So go back to the beginning of this again, hold, do nothing for two seconds, then do something for five seconds, and loop again and again. So we just want to say, do move in direction forward, because the goblin wants, we want the goblin to be moving uh, forward in its direction. And let's set its speed down. Um, everything moves at a default speed of one. One is a jog, so we don't want the goblin exactly moving that fast. We want it to sort of be walking. So at speed 0 0.3, we'll, we'll about do it. So let's jump into test just like that, and let's see what that looks like. So the goblin waits two seconds. And then it moves for five seconds. Then it waits again for two seconds. And it moves five seconds again. So this is only moving in one direction. Let's actually make it move back and forth in, in a few directions. And if we, if we look at the goblin now, we see that looks like we, we changed the trigger zone and made that too small because the goblin is not even uh, reacting to us step, stepping on, on it. So we made the trigger zone uh, too small and too low on the goblin. So we need to change that as well. So there's two things we have to fix. So let's first uh, take this trigger zone, go ahead and fix that. So um, let's increase the, the uh, Z scale a bit and let's also bring it up a bit. I think we brought it down a bit, which probably wasn't the right thing to do. And let's also make sure these guys are aligned. Uh, so it looks like they are aligned, that's perfect. And then I can just set one simple extra line of code here. When started to do move in direction, I'll go over to position, direction, backwards. <clears throat> So what is started to? Started to has this one line of code execute for exactly just one frame. Now in Project Spark, everything moves at 30 frames per second. So a brain runs at 30 frames per second. So this is 1 30th of a second. This line will fire off. As soon as a countdown timer of two has elapsed, started to starts this thing just for one frame. And then this uh, line 10 has no start of two, so this just runs for the full hold time of five seconds. But this just runs for one frame, and that's perfect because this makes our character basically turn in their backwards position. So every time this reruns, they're going to turn around, and then they're going to walk forward. So this will make it kind of move back and forth again. So let's go ahead and test. And now the thing uh, is it will start with the goblin moving uh, one way, so that's something that you'll just have to keep in mind. There's many other ways you can have uh, movement happen 
in in your uh, creature and project spark. This is just one of those. And now we have the trigger sensor fixed. So the last thing to do with this enemy is make it so that if you don't jump on it, it actually damages you. Right now, it doesn't damage you, so it really pro provides no real threat. So we're going to create a new line underneath of when the global player is above, because we want to look for when the global player is not above. When the global player is not above me, then that means I can damage it, because it's I'm not looking for if it's in my trigger zone uh, killing me. So this is where we can bring in another tile type. Uh, on the win side, go to Timing and Logic, go to the second page, and you're going to see this else tile. And else is, uh, is a standard form of programming where you're typically making when statements or if statements. So when this happens, do this thing. And then else looks for basically, or else, if this thing on the win side doesn't happen, do this one thing. So it's kind of giving you an either or. If, this, if global player is above, do this thing, or else, do the next thing. And the next thing we want to uh, do is have this goblin look for, um, let's say, started to. We're going to go to sensors and choose distance to. And then we're going to choose global player. Um, and then we're going to say when the distance to global player is less than, let's say, some really small number. 0.1, so basically they're, they're about bumping. Um, then we are going to go ahead and damage. For now, I'm just going to choose it. Now this is actually going to be wrong, but I'll, I'll, sh I'll explain why. Damage it 10. So this would damage the player 10 points. So let's let's just jump in and test this out. So let's let's bump into the goblin, and I'm not being damaged. I should be bumping into it and being damaged. So why am I not? And that's because you need to understand, you need to really understand what it is. So it, again, looks at the most recent thing on the win side. So you would think, all right, well, the global player is the most recent thing called to on the win side, but not exactly here. You're calling a number, a distance to the global player on the win side. So you're saying damage this arbitrary number by 10 points. That doesn't make any sense. So Project Spark just ignores that. So here you actually do have to define damage global player 10 points. And that should all be good. Now, why are we using distance two when we have another sensor here? Um, go to sensors, call the bump sensor, which lets you know when something bumps something else. Well, the bump sensor um, takes quite a bit of computational power to run. So if you have a lot of things with bump sensor detectors, your game can start running slow. Uh, distance 2 is more efficient than bump sensors, so when possible, try not to use bump sensors. That's, that's a uh, good lesson that you'll learn the more you go through Project Spark. So let's jump in. Let's go ahead and test this. And I'm going to bump into them. And look, I, I get damaged when I, when I bump into them. And I jump on top of them, and I kill them. So just like that, we now have, um, we now have a standard enemy who, um, you know, very basic, but can do a few things that are kind of standard to 2D side-scrolling games. So we're going to end that tutorial there, and uh, see you soon.